recording. Hi everyone, and welcome to today's Lunch and Learn. My name is Terry Weber, and I am with the Work-Life Elder Care Office. Our topic today is on the importance of sleep, something that eludes all of us, or many of us at least. Um, it is my great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Lauren Whitehurst. Um, she is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology here at UK and is an affiliate member with Sanders Brown Center on Aging, amongst all of the other things she does that it is at the bottom of her PowerPoint. Um, so without further delay, let's let uh, Lauren uh, talk to us about sleep. Welcome, Lauren. I appreciate you joining us today. Thank you so much, Terry, and thank you for that introduction and for the invitation to talk with this um, fantastic group. Um, I was really excited to get the invitation, and I'm glad to be here today. Um, so that was a really great overview of what we're going to have, hopefully, a conversation about today. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the psychosocial and health benefits of sleep, and move into the daily and long-term costs of sleep loss. So in the work that I do, I really am interested in kind of what does good sleep look like and how does it set us up for those psychosocial and health benefits? But then also when we don't get good sleep, that might have different consequences and costs. So we'll talk about a little bit of that and I'll give some relevant examples from some of my research. And then um, we'll contextualize some of those examples um, given the, the context of sleep loss in our broader society. And then I'll end with some tips um, for prioritizing our individual sleep wellness and maybe even our societal sleep wellness. And um, we'll have hopefully plenty of time to, to chat and have some conversation and questions. Um, as you all, as I'm, as I'm talking, so I'll wait till the end to take questions. But as I'm talking, if you have a question, feel free to go ahead and put it in the chat when it comes up mm -hmm. for you. And then I will ad address them at the end. Um, and then I will also encourage people to unmute and talk and share. Okay, so let's start off with this pretty common scale. Um, it's called the Epworth Sleepiness Scale, and we use it in my lab quite a bit. Um, and it's going to give you all a little bit of an understanding of kind of where you are. So this is the scale, and it asks you to think for yourself, how likely are you to doze off or fall asleep in the following situations? And I want you to think about this in contrast to just feeling tired, right? So you can feel kind of fatigued or a little bit of tired, versus actually falling asleep. So you're gonna use the falling scale and you're gonna use a zero would mean you would never fall asleep. A one means you have a slight chance of dozing. A two is a moderate chance of dozing. And a three is a very high chance of dozing. And I'm gonna give you eight situations. So the first one is if you're sitting and reading, give yourself a score, zero to three. Watching TV, again, a score, zero to three. Sitting inactive in a public place, like a movie theater or in a meeting. As a passenger in a car for an hour without a break. Importantly, that didn't say driver, passenger. Lying down in the afternoon when circumstances permit. Sitting and talking to someone. Sitting quietly after lunch without alcohol. And then lastly, in a car while stopped for a few minutes in traffic. So for each of these scenarios, give yourself a score zero to three, and then add up your score across all eight of these items. So I, this is a really great scale because it gives us a good understanding of kind of how sleepy you are while you're walking out in your day. And I always think about sleep in your kind of waking experience as tightly linked to each other. How well you sleep is going to really be related to the quality of life you have when you're awake. And sometimes that quality of life that you have when you're awake can kind of go back and impact your sleep at night. So generally speaking, when we're looking at this scale, the adult average of, you know, daytime fatigue is people who have a score of six or less. That's a total score of six or less. And individuals who are walking around with almost pathological levels of daytime sleepiness, where we might suggest that they go see a sleep clinic or a, um, a, a center for sleep medicine, that's if you're scoring 10 or above. I wish it was less common that people score 10 or above. Some of you might be thinking about what your scores are at this very moment. And I hope you can take that with you as we start to contextualize our conversation around sleep. 
So what the literature tells us and what we know from, sci from some scientific ex exploration is that bad things happen to us when we don't sleep. So we know that individuals have an increased risk of heart attacks when they're not sleeping well. Particularly in this study, it was shown that individuals who are sleeping less than six hours on average have a 20% increased risk for a cardiovascular incident. Sleep is tightly linked to our cognitive the function and our attentional abilities. And so in this study, they found that individuals who are sleeping less than four hours in the past 24 hours had significantly higher risk of getting in a car accident, for example. Um, there's really great literature thinking about kind of intoxication due to al alcohol and, and sleep deprivation or sleepiness and its risk and your risk for car accidents. And then lastly, this study is one of my favorites. Um, in this study, we often think about kind of how, how we when we're when we're sick, we actually feel pretty sleepy, and we need sleep to kind of get over that illness. This study actually found that um, sleep might also protect you from getting sick in the first place. So they had participants monitor their sleep for about a week, and with a variety of objective and subjective measures. And then they brought them into the a research lab, and they exposed them to a kind of common cold virus. And what they found was that those participants who were sleeping less than five hours on average the night before had a 100% increased risk of getting of catching that virus and having more severe symptoms of that virus compared to those participants who were sleeping more than seven hours that week before. So not only does sleep help you get over sickness or illness, it also protects you from getting from catching it, right? We're coming in contact with 10,000 pathogens a day. If you're well slept, you'll likely not get that. You'd likely have a stronger immune system to protect you from those Ill from, from those diseases. Now, in addition to some of these like physical health benefits of sleep, it also supports our psychological health. So this study, um, this, this particular kind of representation is some work that was done in rodents that show that the same neurons that are involved with what you learn as you're walking throughout your day and you're taking in information are also active at a slightly different rate, but are in a similar pattern when you fall asleep at night. So this was evidence that supports the theory of one of the reasons why we might sleep at all is we actually end up replaying what we learn throughout the day during sleep and we strengthen that relationship in order to protect our long-term memory function, to keep the memories that we make about our lives stabilized in our brains over time. And it turns out that when you look at how well we form memories across a period of wakefulness, you learn some information, you stay awake for eight hours, you test on that or try to recall that information versus you learn some information, you sleep for eight hours and you look at how well you're able to retain that information. Sleep overwhelmingly benefits your ability to do that. You often don't retain or learn any better over time unless you sleep. And there's some work in, in our lab that has kind of shown that not only is it the activity of the brain, but also the activity in your body. So your brain body connection kind of works together to support your ability to learn information and to maintain that information across time. And sleep also makes you feel good, right? So it, quite a bit of studies have shown that when you are well slept, you report lower amounts of negative emotions. You are less sensitive to kind of event-based stressors, lower rates of anger, lower rates of sadness. When you're well slept, you also have higher rates of positive emotions. It's not just that you don't have the bad feelings, you also have more good feelings. You report higher levels of happiness, more satisfaction with the, your current life circumstances, and you also display create, greater create creativity and insight um, with kind of specific types of sleep really seeming to be important for that creativity and insight. So in the context of what happens in our brain while we're sleeping at night, what we know is that over our lifespan, our kind of regular neural activity, we have these buildups, right? This buildup of toxins and amyloid and um, neurofibrillary tangle, these, this buildup of these toxins that over time can turn into pathology. Um, and so in a healthy brain, you kind of have this buildup across the day. And that one thing that sleep does is it helps you to clear out that amyloid plaque or those, amylo or those, those um, tau proteins at night 
so that you have a refreshed capacity in the morning. So this glymphatic system that's associated with your with your sleep with your sleep is optimized at nighttime during sleep and not as not working as well during the day. So it suggests that sleep really is a is a kind of mediating factor in the buildup of these plaques over time. Um, and it can also predict. So how well you're sleeping at night can actually predict how much amyloid you might have built up in your brain in this particular study five years later. But we're still all very sleepy. <laughs> so I can lay out the benefits and talk about all of the costs, but 33, one in three US adults don't get adequate sleep. And what I will say is that many studies suggest this is potentially underreported and that it's more closer, closer to, you know, 50 or even 60 percent. One study suggests 76 percent of U.S. adults don't get adequate sleep. So if we even take this 33 percent number, that still means that every third person that you see that you're walking around is really experiencing high depths of sleepiness. And if we pattern that across the U.S., this is, a, this is um, some data that was conducted by a colleague out in Arizona, where they're really interested in kind of insufficient sleep across the U.S. And you can see some really clear patterns here. The first thing that we should pull out is that a lot of us are sleepy. So even these yellow states are still the lowest rate here is 24, 24. 5% sleepy, right? So everyone is still, many people, a fourth of us or so are walking around quite sleepy. But there are changes dependent on this geographic region, right? So here in the South, certain parts out West, here in Kentucky, right? There's a lot of people that are experiencing high levels of sleepiness. So one thing that we do, we do in our lab is we try to understand pattern, patterns in that. So we can look at the state level, but we can also look at some of the grouping. So this is also race and ethnicity by county. And what we find is if we start to look at those groupings, one of these kind of really clear areas where you have a lot of sleep deprivation are also areas where you have high, high, high density populations of Black Americans. And so this is true. Um, so this is true in other and provides evidence in other studies where Black Americans seem to be sleeping less than almost every other racial group by number and significantly less than white Americans who are oft often the most health advantage group in the U.S. And this is after you've accounted, after people in studies have accounted for a lot of the things that you would think might be related to these differences, right? So thinking about age, gender, education, even work schedule, thinking about people who are working shift work versus those who are not, smoking status, mental health symptoms, um, weight, BMI, and even also some health related aspects that might be related to sleep, right? So hypertension, diabetes, these racial, th these racial differences still persist. In one of the projects in, in my lab, we were really interested in thinking about that same relationship. And so we um, surveyed people all across the US, um, which you're seeing here is a map of our participants, where they came from. We had a little bit under 7,000 participants in this study. You can see kind of those darker gray areas are suggested of where the density of our participants came from. Um, a, the blue air, the purple dots are people who are coming from um, kind of more rural areas. And then the um, green dots are people who are coming from much more urban areas. Um, and so, so this is kind of what our participant sample looked like. And we just asked a couple of questions. We were really interested in what is determining sleep duration, kind of sleep length of sleep in this population. And we looked at a, a ton of different variables. We looked at sex, we looked at education, we looked at race and ethnicity, and we looked at some health behaviors. And what we found overwhelmingly was that Black be reporting or identifying as a Black American made you significantly at greater risk for, for sleep loss um, in, 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 in our sample as well. So we kind of replicated those previous findings and looked at this kind of really diverse sample of Black Americans. One of the issues, right, with these existing sleep disparities is that sleep is this really basic physiological function that is regulated by a lot of other physiological functions and also regulates other physio physiological functions. So not getting great sleep actually puts you at risk for a variety of health concerns. So Black Americans, this group who's not getting a lot of sleep, also has, has are at greater risk for cardiovascular disease, things that are related to some of those kind of um, comorbidities that we often see with Alzheimer's disease or um, kind of accelerated aging. 
as well as diabetes, another one of those kind of metabolic factors that are related to accelerated aging. Black Americans have higher rates of that compared to um, white Americans, which again are kind of the most health advantaged group in the US. And this also is really clearly seen with Alzheimer's disease and dementia, where Black Americans have about two times the risk of Alzheimer's disease and, and dementia compared to white Americans. So these potentially, these sleep differences and disparities might be putting people at risk for a whole host of health concerns with Alzheimer's disease and dementia and cognitive, accelerated cognitive aging, one of the foci of the work that I do in my lab. Now, before we go too much further, what's really important is that sleep is not this time at night where we just close our eyes and we shut down. A lot of times people think that it's this this kind of passive activity where you're up and you're awake and you're active and you're moving. And then at nighttime, you close your eyes and you shut off. Sleep is actually a really active state where a, certain aspects of our brain turn on to put us to sleep. And when they're functioning well, we often have this, um, we kind of transition through several sleep stages that are kind of normal or, or let's say normal typical for us to experience. When we first go to bed at night, the first sleep stage that we experience is this stage one sleep. This sleep is really a transition from wake to sleep. It's quite light and non-restorative. What I'm showing you here in these little white boxes are electroencephalographic traces of sleep, which is really kind of how fast your neurons are firing. The lower and the lower the, this wave, the more neurons are likely firing. The lower, the higher frequency, the more neurons that are likely firing. And then the the slower and taller this wave, the less neurons that are firing, and the more that those neurons are synchronized. So I'll explain that here in a, in a second. Stage one sleep, a lot of neurons are still fly, firing, but they're starting to slow down in your brain. As you transition into stage two sleep, your the neurons in your brain start to slow their firing a little bit more about 60% of our entire night of sleep is made up of stage two sleep. And we also have very specific signatures in this sleep stage that data and evidence have shown are specifically related to our cognitive ability. For example, these sleep spindles, what I, which you see depicted right here, are these fast frequency um, neuro, neuronal oscillations that are representative of communication between different brain regions. And our, in, at, at night. Um, it's really this transfer and it's um, a part of our brain's ability to kind of lay down memories. Um, this signal is one of those representations at night. And then we have slow wave sleep, which is when the neurons in our brain start slowing their neuronal firing to the slowest rate, right? So they're really, our brain is starting to kind of break down a little bit, slow down a little bit. Um, but importantly, those neurons are also firing at the same time. So that process, slower neuronal firing, but firing at the same time seems to be really clearly linked to our ability to consolidate those memories or to replay the information that we learned throughout the day. And then lastly, we have rapid eye movement sleep, which is I often think of as like the rock star sleep. Everyone knows a little bit about REM. It is associated with very memorable dreaming. It makes up about 20% of every night of sleep. And during REM, rapid eye movement sleep, our neurons they start firing a little bit faster. It looks a little bit more like stage one compared to slow wave sleep, for example. And this is associated with um, a way for the knowledge that we've acquired, the learning that we've done throughout our, throughout our day to be kind of reintegrated with the learning, with things that we've learned throughout our life, new memories integrated with old memories, those memories kind of being connected with each other in ways that make us more and more adaptive. So REM sleep has been associated with things like insight into really difficult problems, as well as creativity. Also, given that our sleep stages, our sleep is not a monolith, specific sleep stages have been more associated with things like Alzheimer's disease and cognitive decline than others. So this is a study from 2020 where um, a colleague at University of California, Irvine found that the more slow wave activity in that slow wave sleep stage you had, the more protected your brain was from the buildup of beta amyloid. So again, that sleep kind of clearing those metabolites out of the brain, slow wave sleep seems to be particular to that effect. Importantly, kind of thinking about our, our conversation thus far, Black Americans actually have about 7.6% less slow wave sleep than white Americans. 
And this effect seems to be quite robust, where for this effect to not be true, where there, uh, there would need to be about 159 additional studies providing evidence to the contrary. So this slow wave sleep deficit that has been found might be related to some cognitive decline and potentially be associated with those Alzheimer's disease um, risk differentials. Um, but studies are still trying to explore that, including some studies in my lab. So in this study, we were really interested in kind of some daily links between sleep and memory in Black Americans. We brought Black Americans to our lab several times, and we also bought, bought, bought um, brought age match, gender matched white Americans into the lab at the same time to kind of try to get at some of the disparity that might exist. And what we found was prior to sleep, black Americans were performing a little bit worse on this um, memory task that we gave them. Um, but after, but there was no significant difference in that performance. But after sleep, that's, that difference actually became quite significant suggesting that maybe sleep might have a critical role in these memory differences. When we looked at the sleep of our participants, what we found was that indeed, Black Americans had significantly less time spent in slow wave sleep compared to white Americans, kind of replicating previous data. Their proportion of their sleep, how much time they spent given the entire time that they were asleep at night, which was roughly eight hours, was less than what our, our, our white counterparts experienced. And then the, that slow wave, that really big wave that we set, that, that I showed you before, the amplitude of, of those waves, we had they had less amplitude in that particular wave. So they weren't as big at given, given, um, given the time that they spent in that sleep stage. Now that those differences in that slow wave sleep were also associated with their memory performance the next day, such that when we accounted for their slow wave sleep differences, those memory differences started to started to complete to, to de decrease, partially decreased, um, and we found this for the slow wave sleep proportion. And we also found some evidence um, for the for their their that amplitude, how high that slow wave was. Importantly, th this the data set that I'm showing you here um, was halfway through our data collection. We've now completed our data collection and have strengthened this effect. So these effects are actually stronger now, suggesting that we really, um, that slow wave sleep really might be a mediating factor um, in, in, in kind of the daily memory losses that we're experiencing, that, that this, this group is experiencing. So these slow wave sleep disparities in Black Americans may result in these daily memory losses. What's really key here is that all of the participants that we brought into the study, both our black and white participants, were roughly about 30 years old. So these memory differences and sleep differences are presented much earlier in the lifespan than when we traditionally do our studies looking at cognitive aging. So one of the questions that we're asking in our lab is sleep and potentially early marker of unhealthy aging. So this study was done by some colleagues at Rice University, Lisa Barnes, and what she found was that at baseline, um, in this particular study, black and, black and white participants who were 65 and older were performing significantly different. So when they came in at 65, did their initial memory task, their initial battery of cognition, they found significant differences in their performance. When they examined their trajectory of cognitive, dif cognitive change across five years, black and white participants were not significantly different. So suggesting at 65, when we're initially doing our tests and trying to track um, cognitive health risks across the lifespan, individuals are different at that time point. Their change in trajectory don't seem to be quite different. What our data suggests is that sleep might be an early marker of these daily memory changes that we can start leveraging at 30 years prior to, the, to when this study was, was done and completed. So. What I have yet to answer are the causes of some of this sleep loss in Black participants. And to do that, we have to kind of step out of the physiological correlates that we often think about and move to some social determinants of, of the world that we live in. Um, specifically thinking about um, employment as well as um, stress and discrimination that Black Americans might experience. So when we think, so shaping the kind of set, um, near this last part of our, of our presentation here, thinking about how social determinants and sleep disparities might be related. So first, there's an important historical context. We know that our 
country has a history of enslavement where Black Americans were forced into labor conditions, um, as well as really brutal daily social conditions that extended from the birth of our country all the way to through Jim Crow and subsequent years. When we think about that historical context, sleep, disruption, and dysregulation was at the very beginning. So this is data from, this is a, this is a, a quote from Frederick Douglass's um, autobiography where he think, where he's accounting the conditions on an enslaved labor camp and stating that one of the tools and one of the things, physiological things that were manipulated the most was sleep. And so enslaved Africans were brutalized for oversleeping more than any other thing. And that shaped the relationship to sleep. Kind of jumping forward to a, a more more modern labor context. This is data from the um, US Bureau of Labor Statistics in 2018, suggesting that by percentage, black Americans participate in shift work, meaning that they're working when their bodies would prefer to be sleeping at rates higher than any other um, racial group in the US. And as a result, that racialized labor, both at historically, as well as some of the modern contexts that we're experiencing, likely also equates to racialized rest. More studies thinking about that in an epidemiological framework definitely need to be conducted. Now, a more modern context, which is kind of ripped from social media, is this idea of kind of hustle and rise and grind culture. This is really rooted. It kind of in, um, kind of um, was birthed through kind of black cultural com commentary and discussion. It's really integrated into music and other um, understanding about kind of sleep when you die and, and you, you know, never take a rest. Our 24 hour culture seems to be uniquely rooted in some of um, black American daily interaction, um, which might also shape the ways in which um, black Americans orient to sleep and rest. And then there's an overarching kind of context of the social conditions around police brutality, again, pulling from our, our country's founding into today, where Breonna Taylor and Amir Locke and several other Black Americans have actually, their lives have been taken by state-sanctioned state, state sanctioned violence while they were sleeping. Um, so that context around safety and sleep and some of the conditions that your body needs physiologically to in, initiate sleep, right, a space of calm and, and peace and, and safety, um, there's there's tension and conflict there. So to wrap up this 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 little bit this section here, um, slow, these slow wave sleep losses might correlate with these daily memory deficits for Black Americans. Contexts that value safe sleep might be really key to memory maintenance for Black Americans, given that they seem to have this vulnerability much earlier in their life. Um, and waiting to intervene until Black Americans are 65 or older, particularly when it comes to cognitive decline and, and pathology, is excuse me, is likely too late. So in transition, in transition, um, I wanna say that, you know, if I pull this map up, the I focus on these racialized sleep disparities. But if you look here in Kentucky, Kentucky generally um, is does not fall really high on on racial on on a racialized uh, map, but it falls really high on maps of poverty, for example. When we think about sleep disparities by income, individuals who are making less often report greater sleep disturbance, sleep disturbance here on the y-axis. And there's also sleep dis dis disparities by employment status. So working full-time, reporting significantly less sleep disparities than those individuals who are unemployed or economically inactive. So there's other ways that these social disparities might shape sleep and, and, and potentially lead to um, um, health risk factors that are still being explored. So some final takeaways from this from this, this conversation, sleep is really critical for health and well-being for all of us. Sleep plays a pretty unique role in supporting cognitive and brain health across the lifespan. There's things active when you're sleeping that are not active really or can't be as active or not optimally active at any other time in your life. Social determinants really shape sleep and impact daily cognitive ability. And as a result, certain groups of people are at greater risk for brain pathology, but also a, other host, a whole host of other outcomes as a result. Early interventions to address these health disparities are desperately needed. We can't wait too late to think about interventions. So in, in wrap up, 
We, we all want to know how to take steps towards a healthier sleep practice. So I will share a couple of things with you. My first tip is get rid of the guilt. Embrace your sleep as a critical part of your health. Your sleep is foundational to a variety of your, um, your health outcomes of, of interest, things that you care about, right? We talked about how sleep is critical for your immune health, as well as your cardiovascular health. We also obviously touched on cognitive health and, and some things around emotional and mental health. Um, so really thinking about sleep as foundational um, can support this idea of, you know, sleep when your body needs it. Give yourself the rest that you require. Also, it's important to define your sleep need. I was saying this briefly right before the before our talk. At each stage in, in our lives, developmentally, our sleep need is going to change, right? We know that newborns sleep a lot more and need a lot more sleep than individuals who are 65 and older. We, we, we know that. But we also have a unique need inside of each of these brackets, right? So what your sleep need is might not be someone else's. And if you think you need to get eight hours, because that's what everyone says you need, but you actually only need seven and a half, that disparity might be creating some stress for you. And the truth is, is that seven and a half is perfect for you. And that's exactly what you need, but you're trying to lay in bed for that extra 30 minutes. So really identifying what your sleep need is can go a long way to, towards you having a healthier sleep life. Once you've defined it, you have to prioritize it. Identify your safe sleep, and sleep environment. I always say, make your bedroom your haven, right? Those of us that can live in, in safe spaces and, and have access to these safe environments, make those spaces, all you do in them is sleep, right? In your bed, you should be sleeping as a priority. And then schedule it, like anything else, anything else that you prioritize in your day, anything else that you put in your calendar, think about sleep as an activity that you must, that you must complete. And then lastly, given the context of today's conversation, that we're, a lot of us are sleepy, but some of us more sleepy than others. Thinking about sleep justice and ensuring that every group of people that we interact with has the same access to sleep and has the same interaction with sleep, right? That gets really complicated when we think about the global um, conversations. Um, but if we can work towards sleep as a foundation of all of our justice movements, occupational rights movements, environmental justice movements, thinking about sleep as function, foundational to all of that, really will elevate each of those individual fights as well and provide some cohesion. So with that, I will acknowledge some of the fantastic people that I work with in my lab, um, some of the great undergraduates and some of the current graduate students, um, as well as some of the key collaborators who um, are associated with some of the, the data that I presented today. And then I will wish you all peace, care, and of course, some good sleep or these holiday breaks. Hopefully you can start to think about your sleep practice and begin to engage in that. Um, and so I, I think I left so much time for questions and comments, and I, I hope that um, we can chat a little bit and have a little bit more of a conversation. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Share my screen. Okay. I think I see some stuff in the chat here, so I'll just jump over there. Okay. So first thing, um, Natalie had a comment. Oh, thanks for that comment. Oh, well, I'm, I'm very, Natalie, thanks for sharing that with everybody. I'm really gr grateful that you recently did an evaluation and I hope you um, are receiving, you receive the healthcare that you need to help support those sleep concerns. And then Natalie also asked a question about fitness tracker, trackers. Do you think fitness trackers that track sleep are anywhere close to accurate at tracking sleep stages? Um, I often think about any wearable devices, anything that you're wearing on your wrist or anything that you wear, a headband, anything that's not actually gathering um, neuronal, you, sleep is a brain process. So you have to kind of know what's going on in the brain to truly stage your sleep. Um, however, what's really important is that um, behavioral patterns around sleep are also very valuable. So we often have people wear wearables in our research studies that allows us to get a kind of standard um, sleep schedule, sleep wake, sleep activity schedule on for people. Um, so it's what I will say about activity trackers and wearables is that they're really good at the day to day. They're really good at if you're wearing them for a week or you're wearing them for two weeks to tell you if this day is different from the day before or the day after. 
in and of themselves, their sleep staging is probably not great, um, but it's going to be good for you to compare days. So, you know, if you get a lot less sleep or a lot less in a particular stage based off your wearable, that's probably reflective of, of something for you. If, if, if you're using some of the, the better wearables, Apple has a pretty good algorithm. Um, Samsung has a pretty good algorithm with their, with their watch. Garmin has a pretty good algorithm with their watch. Um, so those are some of the watches that have some good algorithms. There's a lot of them out there on the market. Um, but that, those that, uh, generally, it's good to compare day to day, maybe not take too much stock in the individual statistics every day. Um, and then Ashley had a question. Does medication-assisted sleep have the same benefits of natural sleep? Well, that's actually one of the foci in my research lab where we've looked at how different types of kind of self-medication um, can impact your sleep. So we currently have a study looking at the impacts of alcohol use on sleep. We've previously done um, studies looking at daily use of stimulants and how that might shift sleep. And we've also looked at particular hypnotic drugs like Ambien and how those impact sleep. And there is... It's a little mixed, the data. So thinking about the Ambien data, particularly um, Ambien is a, a, a sleep aid that people can get prescribed. That medication can shift some of the weight, a little bit of what the sleep looks like in the electroencephalography. So when I'm looking at the way that your neurons are oscillating, um, the patterns there, it can shift it a little bit in certain for certain things and not for others. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag, but I will argue that naturalistic sleep is definitely um, uh, beneficial. So try to not using sleep aids um, is great if you don't need them. If you need them and you're having a really hard time sleeping, seeking your doctor's recommendation and working with them to get you back to a pattern where you can sleep is great. Sometimes we have acute sleep loss for a variety of reasons. And so kind of getting back on that schedule and getting your body used to falling back asleep and feeling safe in that space might be, might be something that you, that, you know, intermediate um, for, uh, for short-term purposes, not, not so bad. And then after our afternoons naps beneficial or detrimental to nighttime sleep? This is a great question. Um, I, I, I'm gonna take this question and then I think I see a hand raise and so I'll go there and then I'll come back to the chat. Um, so afternoon naps, I love studying naps. So we have, we use nap as a methodology in our lab to study sleep. It's really great for a lot of reasons. I can talk about it for <laughs> forever, but just for yourself in a day-to-day day-to-day -day schedule, can I take naps to help to support me and not impact my nighttime sleep? So nap, so sleep, just like it's not a monolith and that we have these various stages, which is important, it's also um, really rele uh, related to the time of day. So one of the things that drives us to sleep every night is that slow wave sleep that we talked about. So our homeostatic drive for sleep is linked to slow wave sleep. And so as slow wave sleep builds across the day, that makes us really sleepy. So if you were to take a nap and satiate a lot of that slow wave sleep that has built up, it will get it will become harder to go to sleep at night. So what we said, what I usually suggest is that earlier naps, so naps before 3 p.m., right? You're waking up before 3 p.m. You usually don't see too many problems with your nighttime sleep because you wake up at three, you still have enough time to build up your slow wave sleep pressure, and then you'll be able to get back to sleep at night. If you are waking up at 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. or 7 p.m., it gets a lot harder to fall back to sleep at night because you your body hasn't built up enough pressure. You might fall asleep for a little bit just because of the time of day and you're kind of used to sleeping at that time of day, um, but you might not be able to maintain steady sleep at night. Um, so earlier naps in the day, usually much, been, much more um, supportive of sleep. As you age, napping the way that naps impact sleep can be very different. So if you're having accidental naps, as you start to age, um, you're, you didn't mean to fall asleep, but you fell asleep anyway. Um, that's that might be related to some other health concerns. Maybe there's some sleep apnea or some other things going on. I would definitely reach out to a doctor if you're having a lot of accidental naps throughout the day or throughout you know a couple of weeks or so. Um, and 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 those naps might might be not as beneficial. Intentional naps, great. Accidental naps that might be ind indicative of some sort of other health concern. Okay, and then I think Dr. Yubong has their hand up, so I will go there. Hi, <laughs> how are you? Thank you. I'm it was well. really good talk, Dr. Whitehurst. Um, I wanted to talk to you more about the sleep justice. So yeah. I'm at home, I'm on maternity leave, 
Yeah. And I was thinking about that population um, in particular, and I've been thinking about it while I'm on leave. I've been fortunate to have three and a half months off. I go back to work in a couple of weeks. So it's slowly coming to an end, well, quickly coming to an end, but sleep is an issue. And I wonder how in your research, especially for with sleep justice, you can advocate for um, parental leave, a longer parental leave, because I can't imagine having to go back to work at six weeks at my age. So I had this little guy at 41. Mm -hmm. I had my other son at 34, which was easier. I was in residency, um, but I had to go back earlier at six weeks. It wasn't great, but I, now with this one, I can't imagine having to go back at six weeks. And in many other countries, the parental leave is longer because of bonding and uh, with mother, baby, parent and baby. Um, and um, other things like that. But in terms of argument for sleep, having to go to work, do a whole day of work as a physician, I have people's lives in my hand, literally. I have to think clearly. Then I have to go home, take care of baby who may not have a, um, a regular sleep schedule yet. And then your schedule is the baby's schedule. So I want to know how can we advocate, you know, for better or longer parental leave um, using arguments such as sleep. Yeah, that's a, first of all, thank you for being so like honest and sharing and like vulnerable. Like that's, thank you so much for placing this in, in like a real contextual um, example. And so I'm actually in the process of working on a kind of systematic review with one of a colleague and my grad student and the whole con it, where the conversation is really about sleep and labor and how it's really, it's like the heart, you can't, detract the two, right? So this idea of like racialized rest is, is, is you know, racialized, um, racialized labor is also racialized rest is that's where that idea is coming from because these two things are constantly rubbing up against each other. And the least in our systematic review, we're doing this across the lifespan. So we're looking at um, children and, um, and um, adolescents and young adults at midlife, as well as older adults. And we have a section all for um, pregnancy. And so the context in this is also thinking about racial health disparities across the lifespan, racial sleep disparities across the lifespan and, and its impact on psychosocial outcomes. And and our section on pregnancy, there's been the least amount of data done around sleep and pregnancy, particularly across racial groups. Um, the little bit of data that is out there that I can pull on and like try and answer your question is that Black women, women seem to work longer, going to your question about leave, in a country in, in the U.S. particularly because there's no federal policy, and so the lack of a federal policy means that Black women tend to work long longer into their in their to their term, and they go back to work much sooner because of their their require their need for the, the economic benefit of of the labor, and so as a result there might be some of the things that we're seeing, particularly with high um, uh, maternal maternal death rates and all those things that we you know we, the the headlines have been peppered with them left and right about black women just being at greater risk for death when they are giving when they're giving birth sleep might be underlying some of that right um thank you for sharing your beautiful baby with us <laughs> and um and so so there's just not enough done there needs to be a lot more done in that particular population that seems extremely vulnerable given it's one of the most um sensitive times to for sleep transition new new motherhood or even you know a second child right so your sleep transition it's a really vulnerable time for sleep and it might be patterning some later life behaviors as well. There just needs to be a lot more work done. But yes, I do think that there's clearly an argument around um, how federal policies are, policies are differentially impacting different groups of people, particularly around rest and sleep and how that might be putting in those Black mothers particularly at, or Black birthing people particularly at risk for negative outcomes. But I thank you for that question and thank you for sharing. Um, okay. So Dr. Butterfield, I'm an AD at faculty researcher. I find a 10 minute nap in the middle of the day allows me to work longer in the evening. I heard that key poli I heard that key politicians also use naps. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think I addressed it a little bit, um, Dr. Butterfield. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah. So the, the 10 minute nap is a little bit different. So I usually in our lab, we often do um, 60 minute naps, 50 to 60 minute naps, which allow you to get a good amount of slow uh, state non-REM stage two sleep. And then we do 90 minute naps, which allow you to get a full cycle of both stage about both non-REM and REM sleep. And those naps, we really are interested in the impacts of that on let's say consolidation or some of those um, cognitive processes that need an offline period for you to um, really amplify their benefits for cognition. 
the 10 minute, 20 minute, 15 minute nap, that shorter nap has been shown to be beneficial for attentional processes, even some executive function. Um, some of their you know, hypotheses around, so um, there's hypotheses around kind of the release. So caffeine is an adenosine blocker. And so the, the kind of um, way that these short naps might impact adenosine seems to be one of the ways that um, you get that kind of energy or at least attention boost from, from a, a shorter 20 minute nap. Um, and so those are, that, those are also seem to have clear benefits for, for certain cognitive abilities while longer naps 50 minutes, 60, an hour, or even 90 minutes seem to be really great for some of those more complex cognitive processes that take a little bit longer, higher order executive functions and higher in memory that take a little bit longer to lay things down. No problem, Natalie. What role does body position and sleep environment play in quality of sleep? sitting up versus laying down, sleeping in a bed versus sleeping in a chair or on a couch, et cetera. This is really, this is a great question. Um, I don't think, I have, I'll be honest, I haven't thought too much about this, but what I will say is that there are kind of neurophysiological features of sleep that we we look at. So in the brain and um, we, look at the, we look at the autonomic nervous system a lot, peripheral signals that change and shift. So cardiac activity changes and shifts, right? Um, and so we, we we look at that a lot to really identify sleep in human populations. But one of the key signatures of sleep in non-human populations, but also transfers into humans just well, there's some behavioral signatures of sleep that we think about a lot. And body position is one of them. So humans typically have, you know, a supine position or, you know, laying on their side, laying on their back. Um, but like, you know, feet Every, everything is parallel to the surface. Whereas, you know, dogs have like a curled position. And this is kind of how you think about sleep behavior across species. Um, and and that is, and that position is kind of what identifies sleep behavior. Now the relationship to it's how the quality, I don't, I don't know if anybody's really done that kind of the way that body position predicts quality, or I should say I'm unfamiliar with the literature that might be done on that. Um, a side note, though, is if people, in, in individuals who experience sleep apnea, often prefer to prop up a little bit because when they sleep on their back or they sleep on their side, they have more, they're more likely to have collapsed airway events or to have um, apneas that disturb their sleep. And so they feel less restored from their sleep because they're having kind of constant arousals when they're laying on their back or on their side. So they might choose a position that makes them feel better or more restored sleeping on the couch, being propped up. So that there might be some relationship there, but generally speaking, I'm not sure if people have really done too many studies looking at various body positions. Um, it would be harder to get into rapid eye movement sleep if you didn't have certain supports and certain body positions, because during rapid eye movement sleep, our body is completely paralyzed. We have muscle atonia. Um, and so in that context, you would wanna, you know, be able to kind of let everything play out. Okay. What is the first step towards visiting a sleep clinic? A visit with my primary care physician first? Generally, yes. Yes, Kimberly, that's, that's generally the first step. You, have, If you're having some sleep concerns, you would talk to your primary care physician. Sleep medicine is typically seen as a specialty, a specialty um, um, referral. So that's something that you would wanna talk to your primary care physician first, see if they have any tips, ideas, thoughts, and then also ask to see if you can see a sleep medicine center. We do have one here at UK, UK the Sleep Disorders Clinic here in um, Lexington. Um, and there's several, other in, so there several others in various counties around UK. Um, so, so that would definitely be the first step. In lack of sleep impacts, blood pressure is a question from Margaret King. Margaret King. Um, yeah, <laughs> so definitely. So sleep in the autonomic nervous system um, are really tightly yoked. Um, and there's this, this actually an entire phenomenon that is linked to cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular risk called blood pressure dipping. And so blood pressure dipping is when you fall asleep at night, your blood pressure is supposed to drop quite significantly. And that significant drop in your blood pressure is associated with a cardioprotective effect. If your blood pressure doesn't drop, so we call these individuals non-dippers, people who are not experiencing dipping have a greater risk for quite a few different cardiovascular diseases as well as related comorbidities to cardiovascular disease. Um, so, so, so blood pressure and sleep are really tightly linked. Um, the circa your circadian rhythm, your kind of 24 hour behavioral rhythm 
also has an impact on blood pressure, um, but the sleep effect seems to be even more pronounced than even just the circadian effect. So there's there's a clear relationship between the two, and you really do want your blood pressure to dip at night when you're falling asleep. All right, Michael Wilson asks, as you age, if you start increasing the length of time you sleep, can that improve your health or is the damage already done to memory, et cetera, from years of not getting adequate sleep? Ugh, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know if there's this kind of critical window, right? Like that we can recover some of that sleep loss from. I feel like everyone, myself included, is like, please, I hope so. Um, but we're but we're not quite sure. Um, what we do know, and this is something that's, that's really critical, is that we it, individually, we each have our own sleep need, right? So that eight hours per day on average for people, that's really looking at all people, a ton of people that have been surveyed, lots of observational data, how much sleep do you get on average, right? Um, so each individual person obviously need, has their own sleep need. And we know that as you age, your sleep need decreases. Um, sleep, one of the reasons why we think, or let's say, um, sleep seems to optimally, so optimally support neurodevelopment. Um, and so as you age, you need less of it because you don't have to develop, <laughs> you don't have to develop your brain as much, right? So your sleep need declines over time. So as your sleep need, need declines, you, you kind of have to calibrate, like, what is my sleep need at this point in my life? Um, particularly for women, hormones are, are really linked to sleep needs. So menopause transition is a really sensitive time for sleep. There's give an entire lecture on sleep in the menop in menopause or sleep in kind of um, reproductive hormones. And so there's, so that's also another sensitive time. So your sleep need is going to change as you age and recalibrating that actual need so that you're not worrying and like stressing out about not getting enough sleep based off some number. You're actually getting what your body needs at the time in your life that it needs it. And you're thinking about kind of large developmental transition. So we're thinking 10, 15 year periods, not, you know, a couple of weeks or anything like that. And sweet maternity leave is 12 months. Hopefully the U.S. will invest in such leave soon. Yes, I agree. I also have some colleagues that live in Germany and they also get a, a year per uh, per parent, right? So like a per, per caregiver, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, if y'all are having a little bit of a conversation, that's great. Regarding blood pressure drop dipping, do you have knowledge of common correlated issues among those with orthostatic hypotension intolerance? Pots? I do not, um, but there is some relation. There is definitely some relationship between hypotension and cognition, um, where both high blood pressure and hypotensive people, so hyperten hypertension and hypotensive people, um, at the daily level have um, kind of. A um, little bit worse cognition, and there's been some studies that have looked at this longitudinally and have shown that both hypertension and hypotension can put you at risk for um, wasn't these studies weren't looking at dementia per se, but can put you at risk for worse cognitive scores on a variety of batteries. Um, so those are some of the studies that are coming to mind. So there is there does seem to be some um, relationship with a tightly regulated system, right? So your autonomic nervous system, including your your heart and your blood pressure, these systems that are kind of regulated by the ANS, they are the idea that you want that you want that regulation. You want that regulation to be tight and you want it to be flexible, you want it to be responsive. Um, and so when it's high or too low, that suggests that there's some kind of it's it's not calibrating correctly. So that that seems to also have some cognitive effects. Um, but great. Any other questions? I encourage you to unmute and ask it if you have any other additional questions. Uh, uh, Lauren, this is Sharon Brennan. And just before we end, I want to thank you. Thank you very, very much for sharing your expertise with us today. What an amazing presentation. So much food for thought. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. I appreciate that. That's such a kind comment. Thank you. Lauren, could you reiterate for us again? We we talked in the beginning, and I don't know how many people were on the the um, chat or not, or, or on the presentation. Um, how we can each individually find how much sleep we all we need. You yes. know, we were talking about the holiday and that whole thing. Could you just kind yeah. of reiterate or expand on that a little bit? Absolutely, Terry. Yeah. So this is this is usually the suggestion I give when people come to me and they're like what is my sleep? Like, how do I know what my sleep need is, right? And so I often say that you have to give yourself some, some a little bit of time. So holiday breaks are great way to, to do this. You give yourself a few days. I could, I usually say anywhere between four or five days where you have the ability, right? So I'm thinking about, you have a lot of, we all have a lot of obligations, but you have the ability 
to sleep when you're when you feel tired and to wake up when you feel satiated. So this means no alarm clocks, um, no late night TV, right? Like you're when you're tired, you go to your bed and you try to fall asleep. And then once you fall asleep, you wake up and you see how much time that is. Now, the first couple of days you do this, we're all going to be working off our, our sleep debt, right? So we might be really tired. Our bodies might not be quite used to that. Um, so, But eventually, you'll start to settle into when you're tired, you hit you, your bed, you're cueing yourself to go to sleep, and then you'll wake up. And you'll look and see what how much time that takes for you on average. And some people do this and they realize that, oh, I'm like a six and a half hour sleeper. And some people do this and they recognize like I'm a nine hour sleeper. I'm I'm in the ladder and I'm more of a nine hour sleeper. And so, and so once you figure that out for yourself, it gives you a little bit more of a kind of precise way to think about your sleep. So when you're outside of that six and a half hours, you can expect some of the cognitive Co cognitive complaints, right? You can expect the fatigue, you can expect that sleepiness and the related psychosocial outcomes. Whereas when you're in your in that group, you shouldn't be feeling too sleepy. And if you are, if you're getting that seven hours that your body says you need, or if you're getting that six and a half that your body says that you need, and you're still experiencing sleepiness, that might be, it might be time then to reach out to a medical professional to say, you know what, I, my body is, I'm getting the sleep that I require, but I'm still really feeling sleepy. That might be indicative of a hormonal imbalance. It might be indicative of sleep apnea. It might be indicative of a, quite a, a quite a, a variety of other things, right? So once you kind of identify your sleep need, you prioritize it. You're getting it. If you're still experiencing any of the kind of psychosocial negative outcomes, there might be something else going on that's worth getting some more um, follow up on.